This video is brought to you by Skillshare. What's up guys, Jared here to talk about the movie that made the Oscars cool again. That's right, Parasite. A film so mind-blowingly awesome it would leave even the most verbose cinema enthusiasts completely speechless. At this point, repeating praise for Parasite and its director Bong Joon-ho is kind of like vaping. Everyone's doing it, and it's kind of a waste of breath, so we'll save any further gushing for our diary. Parasite was celebrated all over the world for its nuanced take on wealth inequality, but Bong Joon-ho's scathing critique of modern society goes way beyond its riveting plot points, which is why today we won't be delving into the narrative, or the meaning of the title, or the meaning of that scholar's rock. Though if you want to hear more on that, be sure to check out the Parasite episode of our movie podcast, Show Me the Meaning. Instead, we're going to focus on some of the visual details of the film, of which even the smallest elements augment and enhance Parasite's overarching critique. Fittingly, for a film about money, all of the material things we see on screen, from the pizza boxes to the windows, serve an important symbolic purpose. Let's find out how in this Wisecrack edition on Parasite. And of course, spoilers ahead for an Oscar-winning Best Picture that we actually, shockingly, agree with. But before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to Skillshare. After work, I love to sit down and watch a movie or play some video games, but every once in a while, I get into this creative groove where I just want to put some work into developing a new project. Enter Skillshare, an online learning community with hundreds of classes on business, design, productivity, freelancing, and so much more. In the past, I've recommended classes like Susan Orlean's creative nonfiction, Write Truth with Style, which definitely helps people who want to organize their writing, but I've recently been watching classes that focus a bit more on physical production. In iPhone filmmaking, I learned about iPhone videography and all the surprising advantages of using your mobile device to tell a compelling story. For just $10 a month, you can have access to classes like this that will get your creative juices flowing. It's great if you want to bolster up your knowledge about your own field or learn something completely new. The first 500 Wisecrack fans to click the link in the description will get a two-month premium membership for free. So start learning and join Skillshare today, and now back to the show. All right, guys, let's do a quick recap. Parasite centers around the cunning, destitute Kim family who dream of escaping their lousy, semi-basement apartment. They scam their way into the lives of the very wealthy Park family using increasingly devious methods to find work as their tutor, art therapist, driver, and housekeeper. Things are looking up, until they discover they're not the only family leeching off the Parks. The former housekeeper's husband has been camping out in the house's hidden bunker for years to hide from debt collectors. Tensions between the two working class families mount, and everything crescendos at a very bloody birthday party that leaves several dead. After stabbing Mr. Park, Mr. Kim retreats into the bunker to hide for the foreseeable future. Meanwhile, the Kim son fantasizes about earning enough money to buy the house and free his dad. That's the bleak, bleak end. Appropriately enough for a story revolving around a hidden basement bunker, architecture really matters in the film. The grungy reality of the Kim's semi-basement apartment contrasts with the opulence of the park's glamorous home to effectively create two different worlds. A lot of attention has been paid to the architecture of the houses, in part because the entire movie was filmed on sets built specifically to fit Bong's vision. Upon close inspection, you'll find that every choice made in creating these sets was carefully calculated. The Kim's home is based on real semi-basement apartments that were built across Seoul during the Cold War to provide shelter in case of a North Korean attack. Though renting out semi-basements was banned for years due to these squalid living conditions, South Korea's economic boom led to such overcrowding that the government relented. We see the paltry living conditions of the Kims. They reside in a dirty concrete building surrounded by stink bugs. <laughs> As if to literalize the fact that they are at the bottom rung of the economic ladder, they live below ground and must walk down a set of stairs to get to their front door. At the same time, everything in the house suggests a solidarity among these family members. Their socks hang from the same hanger, and underwear covers the walls of the bathroom. In contrast, the Park's house feels definitively not specific to South Korea. Rather, it mimics the modernist style that was originated by Western architects like Richard Neutra, Louis Kahn, and Frank Lloyd Wright. The ultimate realization of the modern aesthetic was the glass house, and the park's home is nearly just that, fishbowl-like in how much it can reveal. 
It also features other modernist touch points like a flat rooftop, an open floor plan, and an overall minimalist aesthetic. According to art curator Donald Albrecht, modernist architecture as seen in cinema has developed a cluster of connotations of affluence, glamour, and escape. Houses that embody that aesthetic abound in major cities all over the world, from Tokyo to Oslo in a form that critic Kate Wagner has dubbed the McModern because of their tendency to each contain the exact same hodgepodge of modernist design aesthetics. That is, they all seem to be inspired by the Kimye school of architecture. Sociologist Sun Ki Chai agrees that the home indicates a sort of nouveau riche aesthetic and establishes the parks as not just the 1%, but the highest level of the 1%. The parks, as among a select elite who have managed to succeed in a ruthless capitalist world, also fittingly must walk up multiple staircases to access their home. It's also worth noting that modernist architecture has some pretty deep cinematic roots, most playfully identified by designer and writer Benjamin Critton in his books Evil People in Modernist Homes and Popular Films and Sad People in Modernist Homes and Popular Films. As Critton's titles indicate, films will frequently depict modernist homes as the lair of a villain, like in Blade Runner or The Big Lebowski or even The Incredibles 2, or as a metaphor for the emotionally empty lives of its residents as in A Single Man or The Ice Storm. This makes it a fitting home for the Park family who, though not exactly the antagonist, nonetheless emerge as the central subject of Bong's class critique. They're part villain in their obliviousness to the suffering of those less fortunate, and they're part tragic figures, with the mother apparently suffering from substance abuse and the young son harboring some trauma. All in all, the perfect residence for this modernist mecca. We could spend forever talking about the architectural choices in this film. Take, for example, each house's main window. The Kim's is short with a severe frame facing a fence that gives it a cage-like feel. Part of our view out of the window is obscured by a hanging rack of plain socks, as if to accentuate the fact that, in such a cramped space, every bit of wall or ceiling must serve multiple purposes. What we do see is a garbage-filled alleyway where drunken revelers often relieve themselves. The window is rarely illuminated. According to Bong, most semi-basement apartments only get about 15 to 30 minutes of natural sunlight a day. The film opens with the Kim Sun Ki Woo slouching on an uncomfortable-looking couch, soaking up a few of these precious rays while struggling to steal Wi-Fi access. Not the stuff capitalist dreams are made of. In contrast, we have the park's jaw-dropping floor-to-ceiling window, which was designed with a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio like a movie theater screen. It looks out sans any obstruction at an Eden-esque garden that overflows with sunlight. The well-thought-out interior design includes a plush couch to lounge in while gazing out the window and generally feeling pretty awesome about your life. That brings us to another central difference between the two houses, the issue of space. Every surface of the Kim's home is cluttered with odds and ends. Cleaning spray sits next to a pair of shoes, boxes are piled floor to ceiling, and the hallway doubles as a closet. What's more, some proportions of the home seem almost comically misconceived, like the elevated toilet which production designer Lee Ha Jun designed to be as close to the ceiling as possible, as if to emphasize the constant discomfort the Kim's experience. The family is frequently crammed together in close proximity as if to emphasize both the uncomfortable claustrophobia of their conditions and their deep connectedness. In contrast, the park's home seems to have never known clutter. The only things we see are strategically intended for display, from the wine fridge, to the family glamour shot, to the sprawling glass cases of pricey dishware. The small touches of disorder that crop up from time to time, like the young park boy's toy arrows, are quickly confiscated from view by a keen-eyed housekeeper. Fittingly and contra the Kims, the parks are rarely seen in the same room together, almost as if the excess of space has compartmentalized each member. And unlike the basic layout of the Kims' apartment, the sprawling design of the park home is right with hiding spots that make for easy eavesdropping and glass walls that make for, well, eye-dropping. This suggests that, though their house might be well-protected from the outside world with its fancy video security system, once a crafty family like the Kims make it inside, the parks are left relatively defenseless against their manipulations. Just as architecture helps tell Bong's story of wealth inequality, so too do the choices he makes about representing food. Food is an issue indistinguishable from class, particularly in a country that has experienced severe food price inflation in recent years. On a basic level, food serves as an important indicator of wealth and parasite. At the beginning of the film, we see the Kims folding pizza boxes for pizza generation, doing low-paid labor for a restaurant that seems to encompass the globalization that's made life in South Korea so competitive. 
it seems that they can't even afford to eat the pizza. Indeed, the screenplay notes the sad, empty fridge, and Korean food journalist Joe McPherson points out that we see the family early on subsisting on moldy white bread, cheap chips, and F-Light, which according to McPherson is the cheapest malt beverage on the market. Once the Kims start working for the parks, they gain some disposable income and their rise in class is illustrated by the gradual improvement of their diets. First, we see them eating at a driver's cafeteria, which Chai notes are known for cheap, filling buffets that working class chauffeurs could enjoy. From there, we see them kicking back and dining out at Pizza Generation, being served by the same employee who previously docked their pay. They've risen from lowly workers to customers. Eventually, they're able to afford beef, which they cook at home in an LA Galbi style. By this point, three of the family members have progressed to Sapporo beer, an expensive import from Japan. Their food journey culminates when the parks go on vacation and the Kims get to play pretend in their fancy house. They enjoy bottled water from the fridge, as well as a wide array of classy foods like shellfish oysters and an even wider array of alcohol. Most amusingly, Ki Jung accidentally noshes on the park's dog treats, confusing them for human food, underscoring the fact that the park's pets likely eat better than the Kims do. The parks nosh on colorful plates of intricately arranged fruit, a particularly expensive commodity in South Korea. In contrast, the Kims pile their plates with rice and vegetables at the buffet. For the parks, food is a matter of enjoyment. For the Kims, it's a matter of survival. While the Kims carefully ration every piece of bread in their pantry, the park boy can tear into leftover birthday cake without a second thought. At other points, food embodies the dichotomy between classes that fuels the film's drama. Most notably, this happens when Mrs. Park instructs Mrs. Kim to cook Ramdon, a name made up by the film's English translator to describe a Korean dish that mixes elements of ramen and udon. Mrs. Park emphasizes that the Ramdon should be topped with expensive sirloin steak, and confirms that it's been cooked through before she indulges. In an interview, Bong noted that this choice was very intentional. This dish is typically seen as a meal for poorer folks, but it happens to be the Park Boy's favorite dish. Bong explains that while children might not understand the classic connotations of food, the rich wife would still be uncomfortable feeding him cheap noodles for dinner, so she added the ritzier sirloin as a topping. Appropriately, this means that the pricey sirloin steak sits on a bed of common noodles, as if literalizing the message of the film. Like steak over a bowl of noodles, the film shows multiple images of wealthy folks metaphorically and literally on top of poor folks. But there's another layer to the interplay of food and class, namely because food has played a central and devastating role in the Kim family's economic history. At one point, the Kims reference a chicken shop they owned that went bust, as well as an unsuccessful Taiwanese cake shop. <laughs> As journalist S. Nathan Park notes, the number of fried chicken joints in South Korea tripled between 2003 and 2013, and then more than doubled again from 2013 to 2019. Part of this was a response to the 1997 Asian financial crisis, which left many middle-class Koreans without work and forced them to become self-employed. Low interest rates made it easy to take out a loan, and thousands took the gamble on opening a mom-and-pop fried chicken shop, of which many, like the Kims, would inevitably fail. Then the family opened a Taiwanese cake shop, attempting to capitalize on a fad that swept Korea in 2016. This turned out to be an even more precarious business, and when the bubble burst, thousands of shop owners like the Kims were left bankrupt, or like the housekeeper and her husband, were left deeply in debt. In this way, the references to the family's history, according to Park, evoke a whole world of middle-class failure, reflecting economic hopes and tragedies that still resonate throughout the country. It shows us that the Kims weren't always living in poverty. They were once middle-class business owners. It was their inability to turn food into a livelihood that ultimately crippled them. There's one other aspect of the production design that feels too important not to name, specifically the array of Native American-themed toys that the Park son constantly plays with, ranging from a teepee to a headdress to a bow and arrow. Here we see the boy enjoying American commodities. The mother even brags that the teepee comes from America, which Chai says probably makes her feel cosmopolitan. <laughs> Chai notes that, in South Korea, there's still a sense that certain things from America are high class, particularly education. Aptly, Mrs. Park perks up immediately upon hearing that a potential tutor has been educated at Illinois State University. Well, I mean, I was in Illinois, I was in Illinois, I was in Illinois. 
At the same time, it's interesting that the boy is imitating Native American culture rather than playing, say, American cops and robbers. Here we think Bong is being a bit sly. The park boy is unknowingly taking on the fashions and cultural objects of a historically, brutally mistreated demographic of Americans for his own amusement. This only bolsters our sense that the parks exist in a blissful bubble of privilege. As Bong puts it, the actual history of Native Americans is very complicated, but the mother and the boy don't care about the complexity at all. It's just a decoration for them. At one point, the boy sleeps outside in his teepee in the rain, as if role-playing a less fortunate life than the one he leads. Brilliantly and uncomfortably at the exact same moment, the Parks lie on the couch, sexually role-playing a scenario in which Mrs. Park is selling sex for drugs. The two simultaneous narratives evoke the family's obliviousness to and disregard for the realities of living in poverty. Safe and secure in their wealth, pretending to be poor turns a grim, brutal way of life into a fun, daring game. Parasite creates a modern capitalist fable that warns of the immorality and dark implications of income inequality. And within the film, every set, prop, or slice of pizza contributes a little bit to that message. But what do you guys think? Is Bong Joon-ho a freaking genius? Is Parasite a fun family thriller? Or a subtle invitation to set fire to the system? Let us know in the comments. Thanks again to our incredible patrons for supporting our podcast and the channel. Go ahead and click that subscribe button. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.